Shaul, or Paul, the sent one, apostle, to the Gentiles stated that the living oracles, the oracles of God, are committed to the Jews. The oracles, so which in the Greek is logion, which is the communication. God's word was committed to the Jews. And our theme through this series is, let the Jews interpret the scriptures the Jews have written, and we'll leave plenty of time at the end of the series for the Gentiles to interpret all the scriptures that the Gentiles have written. Ladies and gentlemen, Nehemiah Gordon. Michael, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me again. Nehemiah, this has been an amazing journey <clears throat> from uh, uh, from the, the very first time that, that we launched into a, a problem. Really, I brought my problem to you. It wasn't your problem. Right. Yeshua said something, as it's recorded in the King James Version, mm -hmm. that really contradicted his message and everything he did in his entire ministry. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day we were in my yeah. uh, in my uh, home there in Jerusalem, uh -huh. and, uh, and I, I laid this thing out, and and uh, it's uh, Matthew chapter 23. Yeah, right. Scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, whatever they bid or command you to do and observe, that do and observe. And, and I said, this uh, goes against everything Yeshua ever taught, everything mm -hmm. that he did. And we, uh, we went back through the gospel record to, to see that very thing. And you said, yeah. okay, you know, this is, I don't have a dog in this fight. This is not my problem, right. you know. And, and you know, Michael, one of the ways I could have handled it the way some Jews would have handled it is I could have said, well, Michael, you know, I'm a Jew. I, the New Testament isn't my scriptures. This proves your scriptures is invalid because between Matthew 15 and Matthew 23, there's a contradiction Throw out the whole book. I could have done that. That's and, and, right. But that's not but, my approach. My approach, I don't find that very interesting. What I find more interesting is to say, okay, this is an ancient text written by Jews. What does it mean in its context? Right, right. This and you said this is an apparent contradiction yeah. in an ancient text. That yeah. is my field. Yeah. Let me see what I can do. Right. But I could have played the game and said, "Oh, I got you, Michael. There's a contradiction in the New Testament." <laughs> but you know, I, I wouldn't have learned anything from that. And what I felt instead, I sh could. If do. you were that kind of person, I wouldn't have come to you. But I knew that you were a honest, right. a very honest scholar. Yeah. So and I, that you said it exactly the way that you right. see it. So, so from a, a scholarly perspective, I want to see: Is there any way that I can, you know, figure this out? Is there any source that, that maybe sheds light on this? And we ended up looking at this Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew, mm -hmm. which is, has been you know, a treasure trove of information and insights. And you know, some people get really nervous. They say, so you're telling us we should throw away our Greek Bible? I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is this Hebrew version of Matthew was another witness to the things that Yeshua taught 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, it is in your book, The Hebrew Yeshua Versus the Greek Jesus. Uh, explain the title a little bit before we get into our topic <laughs> today because it, uh, so, people need to understand that. So I'll, I'll tell you, Michael, the original title of the book is now the subtitle. And I thought the original title of the book was New Light on the Seat of Moses from Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. And I thought that was the most brilliant <laughs> title of a book that anybody had ever written in the history of mankind. Yeah, yeah. And I sat down with the cover designer who is this Orthodox Jewish woman in Jerusalem. And she, you know, I had to explain to her what the book's about. She wasn't going to read it. I had to explain it to her. And, she, and, and when I explained, what I explained to her is the way that Jesus is pre presented in the Greek manuscripts in the Greek text is different than how Yeshua is presented on this matter in the Hebrew version of the Gospel of mm -hmm. Matthew. Right. And she said, so what you're describing is the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus. Well, she came up she with She came that. up, the Orthodox Jewish woman. You know, she said, what's the book about? I explained it to her and she said, well, that's the title. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. no, that sounds like a boxing fight, like, you know, macho camacho right, against, you know, <laughs> you know, but she convinced me, you know, and I, I was like, I can't get rid of, I love my title. So we made it the subtitle because I just couldn't let go of it. Mm -hmm, but that's mm -hmm. when I had to explain it to someone who knew nothing about this, never read the New Testament, you know, didn't know anything about it and explained it to her. She said, so what you just described to me is the Hebrew Yeshua verses in contrast to the Greek Jesus. Not that there was two different people, right. but it's the way he's described in these different texts as they've come down to us is it sheds different light on, on, and, on who he and, was, uh, what really, he taught. You know, uh, it comes down to uh, also 
uh, not only different texts, but mm -hmm. also different perspectives. A Western mm -hmm. Gentile perspective oh, yeah. of Yeshua, completely mm -hmm. removed from the culture, the language, the times, the 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 talk and all, the rules and regulations that they all lived with at the first century and knew what Yeshua was deliberately and vehemently violating. Mm -hmm. See, a Western Gentile, when they read what Yeshua does and when he heals a man who's lame for 38 years and tells him to pick up his bedroll and walk, they have no idea what he's to, what he's really saying to that man and mm -hmm. why the Pharisees the next day are making plans to kill him. Right. And you really and really what we're saying, which is is, you know, and we didn't come up with this. You know, Professor David Flusser of the Hebrew University, he was the pioneer of this in like the fifties, that he, you know, he came along and he was an Orthodox Jew and he said, you know, if Christians for two thousand years have been interpreting Jesus as a Christian, he said, What happened what would happen if we looked at him as a Jew? And you have to understand, this is, this is an Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem at a university who, who said something, and he was the Department of, of Jewish History. You know, he wasn't in the New Testament Department. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? Uh -huh. and, and he started to study that, and, um, and that really became the foundation of what now is a whole field of study of Christians and Jews who are studying Yeshua, Jesus, as a, as a Jewish person in his Jewish context. And it's, it's, you know, shed all this light on things that, that I think would have been lost before. Um, they were lost. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I once sat down with this um, uh, Catholic scholar who was doing a PhD, and the PhD was on, um, you know, a doctorate he was doing, and he was doing it on the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And he said, you know, up until now, every scholar's looked at the Sermon on the Mount as a Greek speech. So they'll look at the speeches from that time of Cicero and, you know, uh, Julius Caesar. Uh -oh. And he said, well, what would happen if we looked at it as a Hebrew speech? And I said, you know, that, that's wonderful. Or Aramaic speech, you know, a Semitic speech. I said, that, you know, to me, that was like kind of like no duh, right? <laughs> but I'm like, this is wonderful. A Catholic scholar is saying this. And the natural question to me was, so have, you know, how's your Hebrew and Aramaic? And he said, oh, I, I don't, I'm not studying that. I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> you're studying this as a Hebrew speech. You're in Israel. This was in Israel. Uh -huh. And you're not studying Hebrew or Aramaic? I, you know, to me, that didn't make sense from my Hebrew University background. Um, but, but when you look at it both from the Jewish culture and the language that Yeshua spoke in, which was the Hebrew language in that context, you get all these insights. Um, and one of the places which is really cool, and we were talking about this before, is in John 17. And can, can we get to John 17? Um, or, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, well, what we one of the things we left off was yeah. in in the book of the Revelation, oh, yeah. uh, where uh, one and a half chapters yeah. in Hebrew preserved in a Hebrew manuscript uh, that's found in the British Library. It's uh, you can look it up online. It's Sloan two seventy three. I did a like a three hour podcast. You can find it in my Hebrew Voices, mm -hmm. and it's an amazing manuscript. There's all kinds of amazing insights in it. Um, one of them that I shared uh, last week was that when uh, in, in uh, Revelation 1, uh, 8, in there in the Hebrew, it says, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Yehovah Elohim, Yehovah the God, the one true God. That's what it says there in the Hebrew. And, um, you know, that's really interesting because some scholars have said, well, at Patmos, there was this big shift and God made it clear that he's no longer using that name, the name Yehovah, that, that Jesus has accepted the rabbinical ban on the name. And, um, and the guy- which, which hadn't even happened at that time. It hadn't happened at that time. There was, a, there was a, an Essene ban on the name at that time, but- And a Roman right. ban, they and, didn't want uh, anyone- No, that was before the Roman ban, Patmos, meaning we're, we're talking- uh, Right, yeah, it was it, before the Roman it, ban. Right, even. right, yeah. exactly. Before the yeah. Roman ban, before the rabbinical ban, so it's kind of an anachronism, but he's taking it based on the Greek text as it's preserved, we don't have the name Yehovah. So therefore, nor when, do we have in the Book of Acts, uh, right? So directly when quoting uh, the, the the prophets where the well, name is. So, so when Jesus had the opportunity to say his father's name, Yehovah, and said he said Lord, and that proves, therefore, because those are the exact words he spoke in the original Greek, therefore it proves that that if Jesus wanted Christians or people who follow him to know that name, he would have taught them that name and made it known. <laughs> now can we get to John 17? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and, yo, uh, really, the, the John 17 setup is, Yeshua, this is his last time with the disciples before the crucifixion. He knows what's going down. 
And these are his last words. And, and, and every time we see the last words recorded of anyone throughout the scripture, you pay particular attention to them because this is, this is like the summation. This is where it all comes together. And now, Nehemiah, please take us there. So, if, you know, if Yeshua of Nazareth wanted his disciples to know that the name of the Father was yud heh vav -He Yehovah, he surely would have told them. That's a really good, I mean, it makes sense, that argument. John 17, 6. Uh, can you read it from yours? I'll read you what okay. I have here. This I is have, uh, uh, yeah, uh, King James. Yeah. I have manifested thy name oh, unto manifested. the men. Oh, <laughs> manifested. Manifested. Can I tell you what that sounds like to me? Okay. Like he's a magician and he pulled the, you know, he manifested a rabbit out of the hat. Here's what it says based on the Greek. This is okay. the Greek text. Just, just Greek, okay. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. And then again at the end, I've made your name known. And that's what it legitimately says in the Greek. Some English translations have that. Like I'm reading it here from the, I think it's the New Revised Standard Version. Mm. And, and that's what it says in the Greek, I've made your name known. John 17, 26, he ends the speech. I made your name known to them. And, and we call that in, um, in textual studies an in inclusio. He opens the speech with the phrase, I made your name known, and he ends it with the same phrase. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a rhetorical device throughout the Hebrew language where I want to emphasize a point. I start with something and I end with it. And then, and then if you look at 17.1, which is part of that speech, he says, Father, and at the end in verse 25, again, he says, Father, he's addressing God as Father. And what's interesting here, now this is something that would be completely lost in the English. And I'll be honest, Michael, I didn't notice this until I was speaking with um, a Messianic pastor and he said, Nehemiah, you know, we were spending some time together studying, and he said, would you look at the Hebrew uh, translation of John 17 for me? And I'm like, why would I look at a Hebrew translation of John 17? I know that's not the original. The yeah, I, yeah. And I know it's from the Greek. It's yeah. by a man named Franz Dalich, a great Bible scholar of he ancient Hebrew, who translated John 17 into the Hebrew in, in, from Greek. I said, well, why would I bother looking at that? He said, just do me a favor. So I start looking at it, and I'm blown away completely unexpected, I found something he didn't, I mean, he had no idea what I would find, right? Mm -hmm. So, but he, he had a hunch, and I give him credit, he had that hunch. And I look at it, and what I find is, you know, I've talked in the past about Hebrew word puns, and a Hebrew word pun is where they take a certain Hebrew word, and they use it repeatedly throughout the passage, and sometimes they'll use two similar sounding words repeatedly after the pass, uh, throughout the passage. They'll just punch it. They'll use that word over and over and over. And there's this great thing there where they, um, I bring an example in my book, uh, The Hebrew Show Versus the Greek Jesus, where it's, um, it's this beautiful thing where, where Yeshua is talking about paying a debt. And the word to pay is shalem. And he repeats the word five times, shalem, 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 shalem. Like at the end of the parable, you're like, do we need to keep repeating the same word? And that's the Hebrew style. And at the end he says, so shall my father in heaven do if each man forgive his uh, fellow with a complete heart. And the Hebrew phrase complete heart is lev shalem. So the word shalem means pay, but it also means complete. So that's a beautiful, typical mm. Hebrew word pun. In fact, the, t the, the, the beauty of it, of the, the character of the Hebrew is we're using the same word or similar sounding words with different meanings and that ties it together. It's a way you can memorize it as well. Mm -hmm. It helped the people who, who weren't necessarily literate, who had just heard this once and they'd be like, oh yeah, pay, 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 pay complete heart, you know, that ties in the concept together. And, and that figure of speech, you don't see it in Greek, don't see it in Aramaic, it is non-existent. Oh, and the beauty of that example is you read it in Greek and it doesn't say a complete heart. It just says a heart, right? I mean, it's, ah. it's, it's beautiful there. It's in, uh, I think it's Matthew 18. It's in my book, uh, Hebrew Show versus the Greek Jesus. And um, so we have this beautiful thing here in, um, in John 17. Can we go back to John 17? Uh, or? Uh, please do, okay. please do. So, and I only saw this when I looked in Franz Dalich's Hebrew translation. So this is the beautiful thing he did. He translated it from Greek into Hebrew and things appeared that you couldn't see in the Greek or the English. So one of the things that showed up is he's talking about your name and he says, and he has the phrase your name three times, your name, your name, your name. Remember, shalem, 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 just like in the, in the parable. Mm -hmm. Three times your name, he opens with your name, he closes with your name, I've made your name known. And then throughout he keeps talking about what you have given me and he keeps saying this, you have given me, you have given me, you gave me, um, uh, to those whom you gave me, you gave, I mean, it's repeated. And one of the things that occurred to me as I'm reading this, so there's a common word for gave 
in uh, First Temple Hebrew, which is Natan, but in Second Temple Hebrew and in a little bit in First Temple Hebrew, we have another word for gave, which is Yahav, Yahava. So he's talking three times about the name, which is Yehovah, and he keeps using this verb over and over, Yahava, 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 which sounds like the name Yehovah. Mm -hmm. And he, I mean, he uses this verb. 16 times in 26 verses. This is not a coincidence. Right, you, right, even, right. Even when you read it in English, you're like, why does he keep repeating himself? Because that's the Hebrew style. Mm -hmm. You want to, you know, punch that, that key word that has the sound, has the sound of the point you're trying to get to, which is making the name known. So he says, I've made your name known. Those whom you gave me, you gave me, you gave me, I gave, you gave. And that's Yahava, Yahava, Yahavta, Yahavti, Yahavtani. It's, it's the, it sounds like the name Yehovah. Well, if that was all, you know, that'd be impressive, but maybe it's a coincidence. Five times he talks about love, which is Ahava. So you have Yehovah, the name, Yehava to give, and Ahava to love. That's three words that sound very similar in the Hebrew language. There's no way that he gives this speech and that's not just jumping jumping off, not jumping off the page, jumping off his lips to their ears mm -hmm. that he's punching this concept of those who you've given me love and the name of the Father, Yehovah. And of course, he calls the Father, Avi, my Father. So you've got mm -hmm. Yehovah, Ahava, Yehovah, Avi. There is this, uh, we call assonance or uh, paranomosia. It's Hebrew word puns. This is a central theme throughout this passage of John 17. And the bottom line is, what ties all of this together is that Yeshua says, I made your name known, and we know what that name is. It's Yehovah. He is, and, you know, and, and translating it as I've manifested your name is very clever, right? What does that mean, I've manifested your name? I don't even know what it means, right? My actions have shown your name, and, and maybe that's it true. Could, it, and and yeah. maybe that's true as well. But to mm -hmm. make your name known, especially in the context of, of, of later Jewish history where the name became a secret, so at that time, it wasn't a secret. So he's telling his disciples, if you take this at face value, the name of my father is Yehovah. That's the face value of what it says, if you take it seriously. Okay, now, twice. And now, now this is uh, literally, this is the Lord's prayer. This is Yeshua's prayer to the father about his disciples there. That, that's that's mm -hmm. what this is. And okay. as we started out the whole series, we see that in the end time fulfillment of Moses' prophecy, Jeremiah's prophecy, Joel's mm -hmm. prophecy, Ezekiel's prophecies, is that calling upon the name of Yehovah Mm. is that thing which, which causes the Almighty to hear up and, and, and mm. that he wants his name to be known throughout all the earth. We, we started in Jeremiah. Yeah, right. Is that, what was that great thing? It will no longer say, Yehovah lives that brought us out of the land of Egypt. Mm. And how did he bring us out of the land of Egypt? With a mighty hand, so the whole mm. world will know that his name is Yehovah. Yehovah. Yeah. And now we come back into yeah. the land in which it will make the Red Sea crossing pale by comparison, all the people coming in. Yeah. And it says the Gentiles will come to Israel yeah. and know that his name is Yehovah. Can, can I read you another prophecy? This is Jeremiah 12, 16. And, and I'll read the whole thing, but start in verse 14. He says, thus says Yehovah to all my evil neighbors. I Meaning he's talking to the Gentiles. He's talking about the nations that surround Israel. And in verse 16, he says, and it shall come to pass if they surely learn the ways of my people to swear in my name as mm -hmm. Yehovah lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built in the midst of my people. This is a promise to the, to the nations, Gentiles. to the Gentiles. If they'll to learn to swear as Yehovah lives, they'll learn that name and they'll swear by that name, by the name Yehovah. Oh, they'll okay. be built in the midst of God's people. Now, let me ask you, what does Baal mean in Hebrew? Baal means Lord. That's right. It's just the Lord. Yeah. A non-distinct Title. Well, actually, Baal wasn't the name of the Canaanite deity. Did you know that, Michael? Yeah. Baal was his yeah, title. His, it was the it title. Was title. Well, and so the Canaanites believed that their uh, supreme deity, or, or the, I guess technically the uh, son of their supreme deity, Baal, that he, um, his name was ineffable and unpronounceable. It was too holy to pronounce. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> the ancient Canaanites believed that, and his actual name was Hadad, 
We know that from the, the Syrians who, uh, who, ben who did. Haddad. So Ben Haddad was right. one of the kings whose name, name means son of Haddad. The son of the But the, the actual God. God's name was Haddad, and he was called, they didn't dare speak his name, they just called him Lord, Baal. So, <laughs> so here we, we have the, the, History the repeats prophecy itself. itself that says the Gentiles have been speaking in, uh, by Baal by just saying the Lord, yeah. but if they will speak by the name of Yehovah, well, and, and here's the, here's the, the they'll the, be built up. They'll, here's they'll the beauty be and, the, and the danger of it. So if you just call God Lord, well, Lord can be anybody. Uh, right. right. Hadad. I, I, was, I was in, uh, you know. Moloch. I was in China, and there were people who kept talking about the Lord, and they were talking. And I'm like, so why do you keep saying the Lord? And they were talking about some some like uh, Chinese ruler who lived in the 1200s who died and became God, and, hmm. and they believe that you know yeah. that he's the Lord. You know, they kept talking about the Lord. I'm like, that's a strange phrase. Who, who's the Lord? You know, the Lord could be anybody, right? Yeah. It could be any deity. That's George Harrison. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, he's I dead. Don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> My but, sweet Lord. Okay. Yeah. But the point is, Krishna Lord, was Lord, his Lord. Oh, oh, was it really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't even know that. Wow. Oh yeah. But the point is, Lord is so generic, and he's saying to those Gentiles, okay, you worship your Lord. And it happens to be your Lord as Hadad, but you just call him Lord. If you could just use my name, that's unambiguous. Mm -hmm. And I got to wonder if that's why Yeshua, according to John 17, made the name known to his disciples, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just so you're clear, the name of my father is this. Now, it's not recorded the name that he revealed, but through the word puns, it's quite clear he knew the name was Yehovah because he keeps saying Yehovah gave Ahava, I love, Avi, my father. It's He's punching that over and over in the passage. Okay, okay, hold on. Just He didn't make his name known. Yet, the book of Revelation is the only book written by Yeshua. Just like Baruch was a scribe of Jeremiah, okay. hmm. John is a scribe of Yeshua, and what does it say? You know, mm. his name is mm. in the book of Revelation. So right. Yeshua makes his name known out openly. Mm. And this is before all the events of the Revelation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely in the Hebrew manuscript of the late Revelation, you have him saying, you know, I am the Aleph and the Tav, Yehovah Elohim. And so when he says, I've made the name of my father known, I've made your name known to my disciples. I, I think you got, I don't know how you can say any, was he lying? Did he not make the na name of his father known to the disciples? Or was he following a rabbinic tradition that would, didn't come into play for another hundred years? Right, and, and even if it did come, even, let's say it did exist, which some scholars claim, right? This guy who wrote the book Yehovah, pa Yahweh at Patmos, which is a serious scholar, the McDonough gentleman. Um, he's a serious scholar. He wrote this book. Let's say it did exist at that time, which I think the strong evidence it didn't. We've talked about that. The rabbi executed for speaking the name by the Romans. He was executed. Um, but even if they did have the ban of the name, even more so that John 17 proves, you know, what that what John 17 then means is I don't care what the rabbi said, I make your name known to my disciples because it's important. Right? I mean it. Like either way, Yeshua was speaking the name of his father and that's in the Greek of John 17. Like it's there in every text of John 17, unless you, you know, cleverly translate, I manifested your name, you know, rabbit out of the hat kind of thing. Well, literally it's, I made your name known and he says it twice. And I mean, that it just ties in so beautifully with the Hebrew Matthew, where the first two words he speaks after the resurrection in the Hebrew Matthew are Yehovah Yoshia, which is the meaning of his name. Ah. So, I mean, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, this is incredible. Now, let's go back. Uh, I want to take everyone back just a, a few minutes mm -hmm. before he utters this prayer, before he speaks his prayer. Mm -hmm. And this is what he just tells his disciples in his last address with his disciples, that he will send the promise of the Father. He will send the gift of the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. I mean, that, that's what the promise is, that the Spirit will lead us into all truth. And, you know, it's not like we were born with it. It's something mm. that we have to be led. And it's not something that, you know, just a light switch goes on. Someone, you know, does a repeat after me prayer or whatever the, the, the formula is. Uh -huh. And all of a sudden, everything that comes out of it, the, into their mind is true. Mm -hmm. Everything that comes out of the mouth is true. No, it's, it's a leading. It's a, a, a revelation. And, and mm -hmm. this is something that... Uh, in your life, 
as far as the meaning of the name and the pronunciation of the name, this is something that, that haunted you as a child. As a matter of fact, uh, your name has his name in it. So I learned this recently, Michael. I was doing some research on my, on my lineage, and, and you know, if I have time, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a future episode. But one of the things I did is I pulled up my birth certificate, and I noticed my name is spelled N-E-H-E-M-I-A. It's the first word I learned to spell, as far as I can remember, at least. And on my birth certificate, it's spelled N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H. And I thought, well, that's strange. And I figured, you know, at the hospital, they, they probably just spelled it the way it's normally spelled in English. But my parents spelled it some other way. I don't even know why. But I thought, you know, rather than assume that, I'm going to call it my mother. So I called my mother in Israel. She lives in Jerusalem. And I said, Mom, why, you know, I know I saw my birth certificate and it has my name with an H at the end. What, why is that? And she said, oh, you don't know? I'm like, no, I don't uh, know. <laughs> I said, was a little young at the time. Right. She said, oh, because we originally spelled it I-A-H, but your father didn't want you to write God's name. And, and what that means is my name, uh, Nehemiah, uh, and in English. Yeah. Nehemiah, it's Nehemiah, which means Yah comforts. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. every time I'd write my name in English with the H at the end, that H represents the H of yud heh vav -Heh, of Yehovah. And so he, pull, he dropped the H so that I'd be able to write my name and not be writing God's name within my own name. And then I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So... So literally hiding the father's name, which is part of my name. I'm not God, <laughs> you know, but my name means Yah comforts, the father mm -hmm, comforts. Mm -hmm. Hiding the father's name, the name Yehovah, is something that I didn't realize I got literally with the first word I learned to spell, my own name. Hmm. Like that was something the that was... name was, was hidden. I, my God's name was hidden in my own name from the time I learned to spell the, one of the first words I ever learned to spell, maybe the first word, Right. And, and I didn't know that. I mean, I knew when I wrote it in Hebrew, yeah, it's yud Hey at the end. And, and I remember, yeah, well, we weren't supposed to write the Hey. You're supposed to write Yud apostrophe because, you know, otherwise you're writing Yah. I never connected that to writing it in English that way. And, but that's what my father was thinking. Oh, no, that name's too holy to write. We're going to just write it without the H at the end to hide the father's name. And, and that's become so deeply ingrained in Jewish tradition. And, and Michael, in the... In the next part, can we get into why this has become so deeply ingrained in Jewish tradition? Why is it that the rabbis have banned God's holy name? We shall, and and I think uh, we want to explore further about yeah. these uh, these fifteen hundred uh, manuscripts yeah. again that you talked about yeah. last week that yeah. have now just become available in yeah. your hand in yeah. uh, in digital format. Yeah. And I uh, and I said uh, last last week that. Uh, um, I, I am going to, it cost you $1,000 for this. People don't realize what it cost. Not, not only the $1,000 was nothing compared to the thousands and thousands of hours you've spent yeah. in research this last oh, yeah. year. And, and this is really, uh, this is how ministries keep going is because people mm -hmm. who want the truth, who, who, you know, who, who want to, to grab onto these nuggets can, mm -hmm. can, can, uh, can support those who are actually doing it. Not, mm -hmm. not everyone can do what you do. And that's why yeah. you're here on Shabbat Night Live. You do things that nobody else can do. That's why I relied upon you. When I have a question in Hebrew, I don't go to somebody who went to a uh, uh, Hebrew class at D Dallas Theological Cemetery, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or any other place. And so, as I, as I promised, I'm, as a matter of fact, right now, just before we take our break, Nehemiah, I'm going to sign this, uh, this check for $1,000 oh. for you wow. uh, because that is exactly how much it cost you for that one piece of research. Thank and, you, Michael. And, uh, and we're gonna invite everyone out there to participate in the you. ministry. Uh, nothing is free in life, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Nothing is free, is it? it well, it's, I mean, it's, you know, there, there's things that you can access for free, but even, you know, there, it takes time and energy and, and someone had to do it, someone had to prepare it. You right. know, somewhere along the way it costs something, you know. And now we're getting this out. More than 127 countries broadcast. Every bit, every second is paid for in broadcast time. Everyone's salaries, everything that goes on to make these things available to the world at great expense. Nehemiah's life, my life, and the lives of all the people here at A Root Awakening and what it cost us because we pay for this airtime. No one gives it. We put it out there to the world, even YouTube. It cost us thousands and thousands of dollars to put material up free of charge to you. So if you appreciate what we're doing, 
then it's your opportunity to give. If there's one thing I think that Yeshua taught, he said, be a giver, be a giver. It's not just one little area, just be a giver in life. You know, just let, you know, as you open up the floodgates, as you give, then it says that men will give unto your bosom. Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. And so this is really the, the code of the Levite, the one who, who lives their life to serve God's people. Nehemiah, d- I don't, I don't believe you have a Levite in your background uh, uh, immediately, you know, is there? Uh, n- not for my father's side, but uh, I actually looked at my my father's mother's father was a Kohen, actually. Oh, okay. So uh, I found, uh, ironic I, priest. Right. I found his tombstone, and the tombstone, the hands are are, are like this, oh, which uh, is an yeah. immediate sign that you know someone's a Kohen, a, a, a ironic priest, and it says yeah, Kohen, yeah, right. which, which, you know, I kind of knew that, but I didn't know specifically who it was. Mm-hmm. So my father, you know, it's not my father's father's father, which would require for me to be a, a priest or a Levite, but I do have an ancestor there who's a Kohen, so. And the Levite's job was to be the one to minister to the people. With archeological technology advancing more rapidly than any period in recorded history, an ever-increasing number of ancient Hebrew manuscripts are coming to light, and amazing things are being revealed. It doesn't matter what school you went to, where you thought you learned Hebrew, we're going to deal with things, ladies and gentlemen, that are revelation from heaven that have been set up for generations to come to pass. Michael Rood and Hebrew scholar Nehemia Gordon reveal the fulfillment of ancient prophecies in our present age in The Gentiles Shall Know My Name. Um, I looked through hundreds of manuscripts searching for this exact text. Will we listen to and heed this modern day miracle or will we ignore our master's voice and miss one of the greatest revelations of our time? Order The Gentile Shall Know My Name right now on DVD or Blu-ray. You'll get all five episodes as seen on Shabbat Night Live. Own this exclusive teaching now by phone or online. Hurry, this is a limited time offer. Why do Christians lack power in their lives? Why is it that there is such a dearth of miracles that, uh, that magnify the God of the heavens and the earth? Why is it that Christians really are missing out on so many things? Well, the ancient scriptures tell us that the Gentiles have inherited lies, that they will come to Israel when they come back into their land in the last days. The Gentiles will cry out in repentance for the abominations that they inherited. And when they do, the Almighty will make known his hand, his might, and his name, Yehovah, will be known to the Gentiles. It also tells us that the the, the Gentiles and the nations, that they call upon the name of Baal, which in Hebrew is the Lord, a nondescript title of a, of a God, a nondescript God, which could be anything, but yet if they will come to Israel and they will call upon and learn the name of the one true God, that they will be restored, they will be built up, they will be edified uh, in the midst of Israel. And so we are going to delve into these things with Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah, take us into this prophetic trip into the end time. Well, and Michael, you know, here I've got to, I have to profess, um, as you're sharing these things, it's breaking my heart because what my people have done, what the Jewish people have done, is instead of proclaiming the name to the Gentiles, even when Gentiles came to them and said, what is the name? We've, we've perpetrated this, this cover-up. And I, I call my book Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence. And where that comes from is this rabbinical concept that the name is too holy to pronounce, that not only can't Gentiles know about it, but even Jews must not speak this name. It must be kept hidden. And, and if you trace this back to its origins, and I talk there in my book about half the story, and I didn't have, I had to actually cut this because there wasn't enough room in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other half, half of the story is, is Roman persecution, and that was a key part of it. The Romans wanted to wipe out Judaism. They forbade the Jews to speak God's holy name. But there was another internal reason why the rabbis banned the name. Now, the first time anybody says in, in outside of the, let's say, the Essenes and the Samaritans, the first time in rabbinical Judaism that anybody banned the name was in, it appears in the Mishnah around the year 150 in the name of a rabbi named Abba Shaul. And this is in Sanhedrin 10.1. And he says, even one who pronounces the name according to its letters has no portion in the world to come. Mm. which is a pretty heavy statement, meaning I grew up with this concept. I mean, in Christian terms, what he's saying there is a person who speaks God's name, who actually says the name, 
Yehovah has no salvation, meaning they don't, they don't use that term, so that's Christian terminology. Right. Mm -hmm. But in all the right. Jewish terminology of this period, they talk about, they start out saying, all Israel has a portion in the world to come. And then there's a list of exceptions. These don't have a portion in the world to come. And why don't they? Because they violated certain rabbinical prohibitions, right? That's what gets you banned from the world to come. And the world to come, the image there is that is I think what a lot of Christians would call the millennial kingdom. In other words, the Jewish understanding is the Messiah will come be a flesh and blood king over the earth. He'll defeat the enemies of Israel, gather in the exiles and bring peace to the world. And under his reign, we will all have a portion in that world, in that kingdom. Mm -hmm. So they're mm -hmm. saying, if you speak God's name, the, the rabbis are saying this around the year 150, then you will not have a portion in the world to come. Now, um, what most people do, and I'll admit that I'm, you know, part of this, you know, I've read that and usually focus on those words and you say, okay, it's an absolute prohibition to speak God's name. There was this, uh, Israeli scholar named, uh, Ephraim Orbach, and he wrote this massive book. It was like 600 pages or something. He has footnotes that are 10 pages. I mean, this guy is a genius. He's considered the foremost expert in rabbinical Judaism. He wrote a book called The Sages. And in mm. The Sages, he has like a five page footnote or something where he explains this statement of Abba Shaul in its historical context. And he says, you can't just start with Abba Shaul, start at the beginning of the passage. And the ah. beginning of the passage of the Mishnah is, these have no portion in the world to come. They list different people. And one of the people who has lost their salvation in, or in you know, Christian terms is those who read the outside books. And the Talmud explains outside books refers to the gospels. Isn't that interesting? That, 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 like this that is not is. a, it's not a Torah prohibition, but the rabbis just made this proclamation. Anyone who reads these outside books, the, and they call them in the, in the Talmud there, Evangelion, which is no gospel. No the gospel. It's actually the Greek word for gospel, Evangelion. Mm -hmm. Anybody who reads these outside books has no portion in the world to come. And then it says, and those who whisper over a wound saying, and it quotes the verse, Exodus 15, 26, all the diseases I placed on Egypt, I will not place on you, for I am the Lord who heals you. So there were people who were praying over those who were sick. In other words, they didn't have medicine like we have today. Not, not that that's always so great. Um, but they didn't have any kind of, you know, they didn't understand disease. The best you could do is pray over somebody. And, and the way that Jews often pray is by whispering. So, for example, you, you know, you see Hannah who's in the tabernacle. And at the time, this wasn't a common practice. So the priest Eli, Eli sees her and he says, are you drunk? You're muttering under your breath. She says, no, I'm, I'm praying. So the rabbis make the statement that said somebody who whispers over a wound, quoting a Bible verse, has no portion in the world to come. Why is that? That's strange. And the answer is that the rabbis saw that this was working. People were praying over the sick and they were being healed and the rabbis couldn't do it. So they said, if you do that, you have no portion in the world to come. And it's in that context that Abba Shaul says, even one who pronounces the name according to its letters, meaning as part of a prayer for the sick. There were people who were healing in the name in oh. the second century, around the year 150. And the rabbis say, if you do that, if you heal in the name, actually pronouncing the name, yud heh vav -Hey, the way it's pronounced, Yehovah, then you have no portion in the world to come. You've lost your Jewish salvation. Why? They don't say why, but apparently it's because they couldn't do it themselves. Okay, um, so you, you have... Where, where this uh, prohibition begins and where we say the people that have no part in the world to come are those who are reading the Gospels. Well, now those may be separate categories. Maybe, may but or again, they may overlap. Said, what's the context? Right, they may overlap. And right, we, right. And, and, and one of the pieces of evidence that they overlap, now of course in the New Testament you have people healing in the name of you know, Jesus or I guess Yeshua, right. and there's mm -hmm. a great story in the Talmud about a certain rabbi who's bitten by a snake okay. and he's on the verge of death. And a believer in Yeshua comes to heal him in the name of Yeshua. And he refuses the healing and dies. And he's held up in the Talmud as a holy martyr because he refused to be healed in that name, in the name Yeshua, which is like unbelievable. Like the rabbis aren't denying that there's Jews who can heal in that name Yeshua. They're just saying we don't want any part of that, which is, wow. I mean, it's unbelievable. Right, right. So what we know from other sources is there were people who were healing in the name of Yehovah. I mean, we know that, first of all, from here, from the mm -hmm. Mishnah. Right. They mm -hmm. were healing in the name of Yehovah, and those may have been just regular Jews. Jew, you know, the Jewish multitudes who didn't, know, you know, didn't obey the Pharisees, they just read the scriptures, and they read the verse. 
All the diseases I placed on Egypt I will not place on you, for I am Yehovah who heals you. It's what it says. And in their desperation for a sick person, they'd pray over somebody and they'd say that verse and the rabbis would see somebody healed and say, well, that's forbidden. We, we, we can't have that outside of our power. Okay, and now you're, you're reading this actually from a, a Hebrew text, right? This, right. Oh, this, this testimony. This, this is the Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1 and the other references in the Talmud. These are Jewish sources from this period from around the second century. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a Greek source and it's actually a Greek pagan source. Okay, got, got to listen to this, folks. This is, this is incredible. It's amazing. So it's called, scholars refer to it as the Hebraicos Logos. It's a, it's, I mean, it's what we would call witchcraft. And you might say, why are we looking at witchcraft? The way it's described in this papyrus written in Egypt around the year, around the same time, 150-200, is they, and you have to understand, this is a long papyrus called the Great Leiden, uh, Leiden's in, in Holland, the Great Leiden Magical Papyrus. And it has all kinds of Magical papyrus. Magical mm -hmm. papyrus has all kinds of incantations and spells, and they're in the name of Horus and Isis, and every pagan thing you can imagine. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this papyrus, they say, this is a really powerful spell because these are Hebrew words. And they actually mm. say in Greek, Hebraicos Logos, Hebrew words. Now, what are the words? They say a bunch of words that sound like complete gibberish, and they say other words that we can clearly make out as Hebrew words. For example, mm -hmm. they refer to the great god Sabaoth. Well, what's Sabaoth? Oh, I, obviously, that's Sivaot, mm -hmm. which is the Hebrew word that we usually translate as of hosts. Mm -hmm. They have other words that are clearly some kind of corruption of Hebrew words, and you have to imagine there's some pagan who's heard a Jew pray over a sick person, saw the sick person healed, and said, oh, I want to do, I want to do that. Mm, right, right. And, and that got passed on from pagan to pagan to pagan until he wrote it down in some confused form. But they're testifying, essentially, and they actually say at the end of the, at the, end of the, the Hebraicus Logos, it says, this works, it's been tested. Right? <laughs> it's pretty cool. So in wow. other words, somebody saw... Somebody, they saw a Jew or maybe even a Jew who believed in Yeshua praying over a sick person and get healed. And they said, well, we can do this, right? I mean, it's just like Simon Magus in, in the New Testament. Right, he says right. like, whoa, you guys can do that? How, how do I do that? I'll pay for it. Right, in this right. case, he's not paying for it. He's just overheard it. And the interesting thing is some of the words are complete gibberish. Why are they gibberish? Because they were Hebrew words. And the Greek guy doesn't know what those words are. He, you know, it's kind of like when you hear a foreign language and, you know, if somebody speaks to you in a foreign language, what did I just say? I don't know. It was foreign language. Well, what are the words? Forget what they mean. I don't even know what words you spoke. I can't even detect where the word began. One word began, another ended, or what the sounds were, right? So in this Hebraicos Logos, one of the words that appears over and over and over is the name yud heh vav -Hey, And it appears in all kinds of strange forms. And why, you know, so it appears as... Yahuwah, Yao, Yau, Yaa, all the, and the point is the Greeks heard these sounds and they weren't sure how to write them in Greek. So they said, hey, let's try to get all these. Let's try to write this in every conceivable form so we'll get it some way, right? These are, this is what happens when pagans try to represent, when Gentiles try to represent the name of God, especially in Greek, which is a language which is not suited at all for the name. The name is yud he vav he. There's no h sound in Greek in the middle of a word. You have an aspirate at the beginning, mm -hmm. but in the middle of a word, h doesn't exist as a sound. Right. V doesn't exist as a sound. So you have three of the consonants that are pronounced, the final one's <laughs> silent, y h v and two of them can't be pronounced. The first one you can, I guess, represent as a yota, and they're pretty, you know, which is like an I. They're pretty consistent representing it as an I. But the next two letters, there's no way to write in Greek. And you have all kinds of bizarre ways of representing the name in Greek. Now, I, I was in contact with this um, scholar at the University of Thessalonica, and he's a brilliant guy. I can't even pronounce his name. And he's, but he's a G native Greek speaker, and he's doing a study on the tetragrammaton in Greek sources. And I read this study and I had to contact this guy. It's amazing what he's discovered. What he found, and he looked at all Greek sources, you know, Christians, pagans, anybody who wrote in Greek. And, and, and what I focused on is up until the year 500 in his study. And up until the year 500 in Greek sources, what you have is the name represented in 33 different ways at least. Meaning one of the things we've heard wow. as well, it was written Yahweh, and that's Yahweh in the Greek. 
right? Uh, Yahweh would be Yahweh in Hebrew. Well, well, that's one way it's written in Greek. There's actually there 33, 33 different ways. 33. It's represented and I want to show you a manuscript. And so that, that you know, I, what we have with people will pick out one and right. then they'll build a cult around or, it. Or what they'll do is they'll pick out five and they'll say, oh, there's Yahweh and there's Yahua, which is the name of a demon. And there's all kinds of different, you know, forms uh, of Greeks attempting probably through this confusion to represent the name and they'll say oh well that proves in the hebrew it would be yahweh or yahweh well what about the other 28 that you ignored or there's maybe more than that he, he in this study presents 33 from that period i want to show you this this is a papyrus in london in the british library it's papyrus number 121 <laughs> and in this papyrus the name of the father yudhe vave is represented as yeoah which sounds awfully like what I find in Jewish Hebrew sources, Yehovah. Remember, they don't have a huh. So if they wanted to represent, and they don't have a v, if they wanted to represent Yehovah, one way to write it would be Yehoah. And you have that, you can, you can see it plain as day, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if you don't read Greek, right? So the little thing that looks like a W in Greek is Omega, or an Omega, right? right? And that's mm -hmm. an O. So all the other ones look like English letters, an I, an E, and an A. Um, this is from the third century AD. And this is a pagan document where they're doing the same thing. They've heard Jews healing in the name and they say, we want to be able to do that. We want to be able to heal using that name. We don't exactly know how to pronounce it. We'll write down whatever we think we hear. And one time they wrote it down and actually a number of times as Yehoah. Now, does that prove his name is Yehovah? Of course not. The Greek's full of confusion. And here I have a, a, a list of Greek transcriptions of yud heh of the name Yehovah, all kinds of different ways. Yeoah, Yahue, Yoah, Yehu, Yaon, Yaho, Yaba. Well, which one of those is the true name? I'm not going to find out from Greek sources. And this is what blew my mind, Michael. What I realize is what scholars are doing is they're looking at any source but the Jews. We'll look at dozens of different Christian sources written in Greek, pagan sources, even Gnostic sources, which maybe I'll get to in a minute, anybody but the Jews. And why is that? Because the Jews don't know the name. Everybody knows that the Jews don't know the name. So let's hear what everybody has to say. Everyone but the Jews, just not the Jews. Right. And uh, Here's another one <laughs> that we see, you know, just creeping up all over the world. If the Jews say it or the Jews do it, it's got to be wrong, which yeah. is in direct contradiction to what it says in the New Testament, right. that the, the living word of God was committed to the Jews. And, right. and they're the only ones that, that have, uh, have, have kept this. And, and, and look, I'm not now saying, the manuscripts have come out. And, and we'll get to that. But I, and I'm not saying blindly follow everything the rabbis say. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely not. But if the Jews have said something and they consistently preserve this information and it's consistent with the Bible, why would you go and look at a Greek magical incantation to find out how to pronounce the Father's name when it's in Jewish sources repeatedly? I mean, the Jewish sources, and, and we'll get to this maybe in a future uh, episode. If, if, can I come back and to share this, Michael, in a future episode? Uh, yeah, yeah, we can't so, quit so, now. So can't one of the now. things I want to share, and this is one of the you know, discoveries, I, I, I contacted you and said, I want to share this, Michael. I found up to date 52 Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible with the vowels Yehovah, and I found 16 different rabbis who say the name is Yehovah. And, and, and what we're having, what we're seeing in, in secular scholarship and in the Hebrew roots world and the Christian world is anybody but the Jews. Now, and I want to bring an extreme illustration of this. So there's a professor at the University of Helsinki and his name is uh, Antti Marjanin. And you can find this online. That, that's, I think, why it's spread through the blogosphere. But he, what he's done is he's written actually a serious scholarship. This is not some crackpot on Facebook. This is a serious scholar at a university. And he wrote a paper called A Nag Hammadi Contribution to the Discussion about the Pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton. In other words, what can we learn from ancient Nag Hammadi sources? Now, oh my goodness. Nag Hammadi is known in the Christian world as the source of the Gnostic Gospels. And it sounds real impressive. Wow. The Gnostics preserved that the name is Yahweh. And that's his conclusion. Wow, that sounds real interesting. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So Gnostic, these Gnostic sources we know are translated from Greek. There's no question about that. And this particular document is called the Gnostic Apocryphon of John. And it's translated from Aramaic, or at least parts of it comes from Aramaic. And if we assume they heard the name Yudhe Vavhe, that meant a Jew-speaking Hebrew 
was overheard by an Aramaic speaker, maybe another Jew, who then was overheard by a Greek, who was then transcribed and translated into Coptic, which is an Egyptian language. So we're getting this fourth hand. So what are they talking about in the Gnostic Apocryphon of John? I looked this up and I couldn't believe that somebody would seriously bring this as proof of how to pronounce the Father's name. It's like bringing the Hebraicos Logos and saying, well, this proves the pronunciation. What the, the magical papyri proves is that Gentiles, pagan Gentiles, heard Jews healing in the name. It doesn't tell us how to pronounce that name because it's all confused. And what's, oh, I didn't get to that. I forgot this. So in the Hebraicos Logos, one of the names that appears alongside Ya'u and Ya'o and all these in Ya'u, eh, all these pronunciations is the name Jesus, which is the Greek representation of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And it, you got to really wonder. So they say these are Hebrew words. And so clearly they heard a Jew healing in the name yud heh vav -Heh, but it sounds like they also heard heal, someone healing using the name Yeshua and Yehovah at the same time, which then ties back to the rabbi saying, well, if you heal in that name, you have no portion in the world to come. That's how it ties into people who read the outside books. So they're reading the gospels and they're healing in the name Yehovah and then they end up healing in the name Yeshua. We got to just ban the name altogether. That's what happened in rabbinical Judaism, right? It was this slippery slope which they saw these things happening in front of their eyes. They said, we can't control this. We better ban it. Um, so back to the Gnostic Apocryphon of John with this a serious scholar. So the only ones left really speaking the name are believers in Yeshua, really, who are actually healing people. According to these sources. Yeah. I wasn't there, but that's what the sources record. Oh, okay, so this is, this is coming from Jewish sources. Jewish and from sources. A, and from a Jew. <laughs> These are yep. Jewish sources. I didn't make the sources up. They're there. Mm -hmm. They're clearly talking about it. And the other one is a, and, and the other one is a, is a second witness from a pagan source. Meaning there were two. There was rabbi seeing this, and there were Greek pagans both seeing that people who called in the name Yudhevave, Yehovah, and the name Yeshua were healing in those names. And one said, "We got to ban this." The other said, "We want to do that." <laughs> you know, the pagan said that. So the point <laughs> is that that you kind of it's kind of interesting. You have two different witnesses who are talking about the same thing. I want to get back to this guy, and, and I know we're running out of time. This this uh, professor, and again, he's a great scholar. I'm not, you know, knocking his scholarship. I'm I'm calling into question the methodology here. Meaning, is it valid to look at a Gnostic source to find out how to pronounce the Father's name, which is what he argues? Um, and I've seen people in the Christian world say, "Well, it's the Gnostics. They say it's Yahweh, right?" So, what are the Gnostics talking about? So if you read the Gnostic Apocryphon of John, it's horrific what they're talking about, Michael. They talk about a demon called Yalda Baoth. And there's almost no question that Yalda Baoth is an Aramaic or Hebrew word, probably Aramaic. There's similar languages. And in Aramaic, it would be the, Hebrew equivalent, the equivalent of the Hebrew Yelid Bohu, which means son of chaos, who accidentally creates the physical world. Then to try to make up for it, he rapes Eve, who he's created by accident, and spawns a demon child named Yaue. So Yahue, according to the Gnostic Apocryphon of John, is not the God of the creator of the universe of the Hebrew Bible or even of the New Testament. He's a demon child who's the son of chaos. He's the son of the son of chaos. So really Yahweh is the grandson of chaos. And this is what people are bringing as proof of how to pronounce the name of the creator of the universe? Wow. I'm sorry, oh, my God's wow, not the grandson wow. of chaos. And, and or, the, or the spawn of, uh, uh, of a demon. Right. Exactly. And, and it's very, what I realized reading this, Michael, is what scholars are willing to do is dig deep into the depths of any pagan source as long as we don't ask the Jews how to pronounce the name. And why is that? Because the one thing we can all agree on is the Jews don't know how to pronounce the name. So why would we ask them? And one of my important discoveries recently is Jewish sources that prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that in fact the Jews did know how to pronounce the name, that they never forgot it. It's, it's copiously documented in Jewish sources. In 52 Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible, it's documented in the writings of 16 rabbis. And there's some other really cool things that I'm going to share. Um, are we running out of time? Is it going to be next time? Well, yeah, we are running out of time. Oh, no, this is the big the, stuff, Michael. i got to share it. So oh, okay, exciting. okay. <laughs> well, we're, we're going to have to come back and do this. Okay. But, but uh, uh, again, this is... This is 
You know, really, this is what Yeshua said, that he would send the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. The Almighty is as still is in charge of the universe, and when he gave his revelation to Moses concerning the dispersal uh, of Israel throughout the world, and then bringing them back, and at that time, the cataclysmic occurrences that will be happening around the world, that his name will be known. The Gentiles will know his name. Israel was know, will know his name, and even though it has been hidden in plain sight in Hebrew sources, they have been covered over and the entire Christian world has turned a blind eye to the New Testament. Number one, that Yeshua came as the prophet we must hear and obey and he's being ignored. That Shaul says that the oracles of God, God's communication, his living communication was committed to the Jews. And this whole idea that everything the Jews say has got to be wrong. If they say that this is the way the ancient calendar was, they've got to be wrong. Everything they say is wrong is nothing but a lie from the pit of hell, mm. and it's time for the Gentiles to wake up and cry out <clears throat> in repentance, we have inherited lies. We have inherited the worship of pagan gods. We have inherited the pronunciation of the of the true creator of the heavens and the earth from pagan sources, from, from pagan incantations, instead of going back to who, to whom it was delivered and to whom it was given so that they would hold on to it. Because once the Jewish people have a tradition, right or wrong, they are gonna hang on to it until hell freezes over. <laughs> And so we're gonna find out what those sources say because we're gonna go back into sources that have never, ever been translated into any other language. And the one person that can take us there is the one person qualified, Nehemiah Gordon. And Nehemiah, with that, I would like you to please close with the ironic blessing. Yes, thank you, Michael. Yivarechecha, Yehovah v'yishmarecha. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Ya'er Yehovah panav elecha v'yichunecha. Yehovah shine his face towards you and be gracious towards you. Yisa Yehovah panav elecha. Yehovah lift his face towards you. V'yasem lecha shalom. And may he give you peace. Amen. 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 Well, I'm speechless. Shabbat shalom. Shavuot Shabbat shalom. We'll see you next week. This is the ride of a lifetime. This is Bible prophecy being fulfilled not only in Israel, but to the Gentiles as well. You're welcome. See you then.